Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Gabriel de Guzman, curator and director of exhibitions here at Smack Mellon. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today um, on our roundtable discussion on food, land, and identity. This program is being held in conjunction with our current exhibition, Land Akin. Um, and the impetus for the exhibition, uh, for I mean, sorry, the impetus for this conversation is uh, artist Tatiana Arrocha's tea salon project called Impending Beauty. Um, and I am actually here sitting in her installation now. Um, it's behind me. Uh, I was showing it earlier, but this is um, the uh, tea salon. Um, Ending beauty, and then behind me, and going all the way up like 25 feet, is um, Tatiana's um, canvas, um, which is called Mi Selva, Tu Selva, Nuestra Selva. Um, so, uh, before we get started, I would like to read a land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded homelands of the Lenape, the Munsee, the Manahattan, the Canarsi, the Matinecock, the Shinnecock, and other indigenous nations. We respect that many indigenous people can continue to live and work on this land and recognize their ongoing contributions to this area. Uh, thank you. So um, I just want to kind of talk a little bit more about the Land Akin exhibition uh, to give you the, more of the context for this conversation. So the seeds of this exhibition were planted back in around 2018, uh, a couple of years ago, with conversations that I had with artists Christine Howard Sandoval and Tatiana Arrocha, who are both uh, joining us in the conversation tonight. Um, and we discussed this idea of re-envisioning our relationship to the land from a decolonial uh, and ecological perspective. And from these conversations um, with Christine and Tatiana, uh, I found more artists who were making work through embodied practices that convey cultural knowledge through deep, co deep connections with the land and with place artists who are subverting the Western capitalist mentality of land as property that can be owned and exploited for natural resources. So instead, um, we're questioning through this, through this work, how, how we can reimagine, um, how we can reimagine that and think about land as more of a family member or a relative or ancestor uh, that we should respect and learn from. Um, and it's with that context in mind that we're hosting this roundtable discussion on issues around food sustainability, responsibility uh, to the land, and cultural identity. And so we're thrilled that Tatiana Rocha brought us together, and we have several other special guests joining us uh, for the conversation tonight. Um, Jung Wan Kim from uh, Rainforest Alliance, Ceci Pineda, of BK Rot uh, and exhibiting artists, Christine Howard Sandoval, Rochelle Dang, and Kevin Quiles Bonilla. Um, so let me just tell you first what the format of tonight's program will be. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Tatiana, who's gonna introduce her impending beauty project and talk about the impetus for this roundtable discussion in relation to her own work. And then we're going to go, uh, we're going to ask each of our special guests to introduce themselves and tell us who they are and what they do. Um, then we'll have a, a group discussion about this topic of food, land, and identity. Um, and then toward the end, we'll, we'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes um, to take questions from the audience. So you'll have a chance to ask your questions then. Um, so Tatiana going to ask you to take it away. Hello. Hi, everyone. So many familiar faces. Um, very excited to be here. Um, super nervous, too, <laughs> just to like say, uh, but I'm nervous that it's good. 
uh, and um, so um, I the I started this. I created this installation in 2017, and I think that the installation and the purpose of the installation has been evolving. Um, but one of the ideas was to create a space in which um, I could have like the, that would be open for conversations and um, everyone uh, in this round table is uh, sipping um, a cup of uh, coca tea and one of the reasons <laughs> one of the reasons why I uh, uh, decided to um, use coca as uh, the tea that I would offer uh, when I invited people to come and join me in this space is uh, related to um, to my background, um, to my cultural background. I'm from Colombia um, and I moved to the United States in about 21 years ago. And I every time that I've come to the United States or that I when I moved here, there was just one question that was always asked and it was like, I heard cocaine is really good in Colombia. And that was the driving conversation that I had in meetings with a client, you know, in a party. And it was just constantly. And, you know, that kind that idea has evolved a little bit. Unfortunately, uh, I think that thanks to um, social media, internet, like that those stereotypes have expand a little bit more. But uh, then came the series Narcos. And again, <laughs> wow, Colombia was related all through that series. Um, and one of the things that impacted me a lot when I was asked that is that uh, the lack of knowledge and connection that people had of the impact of the consumption of cocaine and the impact of the war on, on, on the land in Colombia. And on the land, uh, not only on the environmental aspect, but also a uh, cultural aspect. And the fact that the coca plant, it's a plant that has extreme importance uh, uh, for indigenous communities and, uh, and, and, and indigenous people in Colombia. And I think that anything that I, Say of what I've been learning about the plant is just going to come short. I just had, before starting this, I had a conversation um, with with um, with Aimema. He uh, he's a person that I met uh, about a year ago, and he was talking to me about the plant and and everything that he was saying was just like it made me even think more about how how distorted and how, what, what is this other vision that people have? It's a plant that it's a healing. It's a plant that, um, that throughout the Andean cultures, it's um, considered as a plant that connects us to the land that, um, that I just learned today that it symbolizes uh, the word of the woman, the sweetness of the word of the woman um, I, every time that I have a conversation with somebody that has uh, the knowledge of, uh, about the plant, I learn more and it's a beautiful plant that it's, that heals. It's a plant that heals, that opens up conversations, that, that has a whole, uh, a whole other perspective, um, and, 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 and different, and all these different, this part of the world that it's below North America. Um, and um, I think that that it is, it's crazy to see that impact that the sprayings of the plant has had on the land and the waters and the system. And also the, the, the deep wounds that the war on drugs have created in Colombia. Uh, as a country. Um, and the reason why like, why I'm opening up this space is because I feel that one of the things that I enjoy that I've been enjoying as an artist has been to be able to connect with other artists, learn. 
I think that one of the things we did a pre-meeting uh, uh, for, for this conversation and one of the things that I love and that I love so much is that um, here we are, we all have such different cultural backgrounds, there are incredible differences, and yet we found so many threads that connected us. And, and that was really beautiful. And that's one of the things that I have been experiencing since I started uh, focusing in my practice as an artist and it's uh, that embracing of the differences and everyone's differences and bring them but up and being able to share them. Um, so um, one of the ways in which I learned the most is by having conversations and and sharing in spaces where where there can be exchange. And the plant, the coca plant, also has been uh, used uh, is used as uh, exchange of knowledge. So um, when I started, I didn't know all of these things about the plant. These are things that I've been learning throughout the years, and I'm always excited to learn more and more about it. Um, another thing that I recently learned by uh, uh, listening to some uh, to uh, sociologist and activist, Bolivian activist, uh, her name is Silvia Cusicanti Rivera, learned that um, the plant, and I'm gonna kind of pass it, it's not supposed to be thrown away. Uh, it's supposed to be given back to the land. So when all of you are done with your tea bag, maybe think about what you think more closely what you do with that bag uh, instead of like chucking it in the garbage. Maybe um, give it back to the plant, to your garden. Um, and that would be maybe a really nice way of kind of con concluding the cycle of conversation that we're gonna have that, that relate to this idea of how we connect to the land through food and and how and and the practices uh, and the impact on the land through food, and also how even those practices, those connections to the land, are so embedded also in culture on and on practices of colonialism that happen over different on on this land of the United States now, but also throughout many other countries, um, and that are. As much as they're very, they're they're different. They're threats that connect us. And um, yes, um, I think that it's a space where I'm just going to pass the the the. I'm going to pass it to all the people that are joining me to to continue to share with them with us about them and and their relationship to this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, so let's go around and um, have each of our other amazing speakers um, tell us who they are. Um, uh, let's, can we start with uh, Jung, Jung Wan? Sure. Um, thank you for the beautiful tea and for um, just you know, teaching me what you've learned about it. Um, it's really, really delicious. Um, and I also love that you brought a kind of um, sensory and um, earthy, earthbound element into our conversation, even though we're connecting over digital technology. I still feel that this tea has in some way kind of brought us to a common um, place and feeling. So I really appreciate that. Um, my name is Jungwon Kim. I lead the creative and editorial team at the Rainforest Alliance, um, which is an international NGO that works primarily to advance sustainable agriculture and forest conservation throughout the tropics. Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to sort of veer off the official Rainforest Alliance message a little bit to explain um, how I really see work. Um, we work primarily in commodity crops like coffee, tea, cacao, bananas, um, and many tropical fruits that are grown primarily for export. So what this means is that we are working in post-colonial landscapes where 
um, industrial agriculture uh, was introduced and created a kind of violent disruption of the relationship, the traditional relationship between people and the land. Um, that's a kind of simplification, but that's generally um, the type of landscape where we're working. So in Sri Lanka, for example, um, you know, a lot of those tea landscapes, they were created by uh, British colonists um, and involved um, just a complete clear cutting and destruction of the beautiful forest there. Um, so with that kind of extractive system, the introduction of that style of agriculture, um, a lot of these farm communities or rural communities lost, um, I wouldn't say they lost, but the, the traditional ecological knowledge was erased and I think devalued in a pretty profound way. Um, and now, you know, many decades later, we are all witnessing the long-term impacts of that um, uh, intensive monoculture approach. So soil health is um, declining really rapidly. I read recently that something like 30% of the world's arable land is now, uh, you know, really becoming almost unusable. Um, and of course, that kind of intensive monocrop culture is very bad for our climate because it disrupts the soil, uh, the soil's carbon storage capacity. So um, at the Rainforest Alliance, what, what we are in the business of doing is, you know, until, until we really have a deep, deep transformation of the way that we relate to our land, in the meantime, we absolutely and urgently have to do harm reduction. And what we have been doing is um, a lot of very intensive farmer um, training programs where we're sort of training lead farmers and then those farmers are then doing peer-to-peer -peer training uh, within their farming cooperatives and their groups. Uh, we're doing a voluntary, we, we run a voluntary uh, sustainable agriculture certification program. And then we also work with a lot of forest communities to, um, to really do, um, to really cultural models of um, sustainable forest uh, economies. So it's really about forest-based um, products, um, doing forestry in a way that really um, respects and honors the natural growth rate and replacement rate of trees, for example, and then really uh, boosting a lot more of the harvest of non-timber forest products. So um, that's what we're doing now and what really interests me about this exhibition and about the incredible work that the various artists here are doing um, is that, you know, it's, it's tapping into this yearning that I think um, many of us share also on this, uh, in this conversation we all shared, you know, coming from different places and, and we all have sort of family histories that are very much uh, disrupted by colonization or by imperialism or different um, historical developments. And um, what I really appreciate about the work of all of the artists on this call and the work that uh, Ceci is doing with BK Rot is that it, it, it is tapping into this um, thing or connection to the land, helping us hold at the same um, desire to connect I think the, the sadness and the loss, right, that so many of us are feeling. Um, and that sometimes that's best expressed through art and through practice, um, more so than words can even capture. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jung Wan. Um, next, uh, I'd like um, Ceci to uh, speak to us. Hi everyone, it's such an honor to be with you all tonight. Um, my name is Ceci. I use they and them pronouns or Eye. Um, and yeah, I'm here in Lenape Canarsie lands um, and feel like I wear multiple hats, um, but tonight I'm mostly here representing the a lot of the regenerative work that we do at BK Rot. 
Um, I currently have the honor of serving as the executive director of BKRA. It was founded by Sandy Nurse back in 2013. And BKRA is a um, youth powered uh, food scraps collection service by bike and an electric cargo trike and young people also then transform it into compost. Um, and shout outs to actually Bree, one of our youth workers who I see who is here with us tonight as well. Um, and yeah, I, I think there, there were so, the conversation that we had in our check-in was like so rich with all of these threads thinking of a lot of the impact of the legacy of colonization that has had um, throughout the whole world and, and these lands and other lands. Um, and for me, um, I think, yeah, I definitely have so many feelings around the, um, the severe ecological damage that we've been causing and, and just so much violence to our plant communities, to animal communities, to each other. Um, and the way that um, a lot of the systems that um, that have been built um, through through this violence um, continue to reinforce it. And so where I've found most hope is in um, community driven work that supports healing the land. And I found that in that work, there is so much healing that we receive in return. And so it's incredible to think of um, like composting feels like a very accessible tool that, you know, the, our primary tools we use for composting are like an ice chopper, a pitchfork and a shovel. Um, and, you know, all of this human power, like the youth do this, um, it's, it's very hard labor to do too, especially like when they're turning um, either the bin system or the windrows. Um, but to see that there is something that we can do to be responsible for our waste. Um, and, you know, composting or, or finding a way to, you, all, everything that is um, compostable or is organic matter is, are things that came from the earth. And so um, we're really just finding ways that we can return it back into the earth, into these ways that are more harmonious. Um, and can support future nourishment as well. Thank you, Ceci. Um, and now I'd like to hear from our, some of our artists. Um, Christine, um, you're up next. Great, uh, thank you so much, uh, Tati and Gabriel for inviting me into this conversation. Um, yes, this has been a very long and ongoing conversation that I'm super excited to have and to bring into a public platform. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging uh, the land that I stand on right now um, and the three host tribes um, of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish, and the Musqueam, um, so otherwise known as Vancouver. And I come here as an uninvited guest, um, also as a teacher and an ancestor of Chumash uh, indigenous people from California, um, but also settler heritage um, from New Mexico. And so all of my work is kind of um, looking at that and looking through that and turning that over um, in relationship to land ecology and um, cultural identity. And so um, even in this, the title of this talk, uh, culture and or identity, food and, um, and community that we acknowledge that none of those things can be separated from each other. And so that's really a part of my thinking is that all of these things are intertwined with each other. Um, and that is um, so much a part of the of the work that you see in Land Akin in the exhibition is the result of a three-year project um, that started by going back to my mother's village in northern New Mexico. So often it starts with looking inside and looking back to um, my own family and having conversations with them 
um, to find out um, the way that we locate ourselves and the way that we've migrated um, and the way that we've interacted and built relationships with the land. And that's really complex, right? I mean, you know, a lot of our conversations previous to this with this group um, were about how those are so entangled in colonial power systems and heritage and history, um, you know, that they can't be untangled. And so we have to keep that complexity. Um, and so that's why it takes three years um, to do a project because it's about building trust, building relationships with the community, uh, going there, spending time um, and not really having a, a master plan or uh, an idea of what's going to even come out of it. So there's a whole layer of work um, that is a part of my practice that never gets shown to anybody that is very uh, personal, that is not about aestheticization. Um, and then there's a whole, and then there are all these other parts that involve research, they involve looking at archives, they involve walking. Um, in the exhibition, there's a video um, that um, shows this kind of walking practice that I have and um, the way that I use cameras and, um, and this idea of surveilling the land um, through um, an embodied practice. And I never know what's going to happen. I never know how the land is gonna kind of choreograph my body um, and how those stories are gonna kind of emerge. And, but that's the exciting part about it. Um, but if there's one thing that kind of grounds my practice, I would say that it always is kind of at the service of understanding and unlearning a lot of the things that I um, learned from a colonial education when I was younger. Um, so yeah, thank you for inviting me into the conversation. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, and let's hear from Ro Rochelle next. Um, hello, it's really wonderful to be here and thank you for the invitation, uh, Tatiana and Gabriel. I wasn't sure what I could contribute and I had asked just to be a listener, but in conversation, certain things about ourselves become revealed to us, including our artistic practice or our histories and how um, we, we can connect. And I'm usually in a space of non-language. I work as a sculptor. And so, um, you know, I prepared actually a text to read out of, you know, to help me through this. But since it's a, a, a roundtable discussion, I will leave that aside and, and wing it. Um, I live here in um, I, I live here in Brooklyn. I'm from a place of indigenous dispossession as well. I'm from Hawaii, a colonized place, and uh, a place that um, where uh, that was seized by the U.S. and my family has a kind of complicated place. And I, and I think part of the, the long study I've done um, as just an adult or as an artist is to kind of examine uh, with, with responsibility my family's history and who I am and who I can be in the world. Um, my family, for the most part, immigrated to the kingdom of Hawaii. They came uh, when Hawaii was a sovereign country. They came as uh, field laborers to do uh, um, sugar plantation work and pineapple work. And um, that kind of way that um, they were um, in that, you know, that history of how we, how field laborers are viewed, they were, um, I guess, seen as disposable. And in a way that helps me to understand the way that land and natural resources are viewed as disposable and how we understand, um, you know, how we might um, uh, look more critically at how uh, people who do labor are um, exploited and invisible and undervalued. Um, so in my work as a sculptor, I look at um, the ecological legacies of colonialism. Being here on the Atlantic, it has helped me to connect Hawaii um, to histories here and has really helped me to see um, my family's history and um, you know Hawaii's history more broadly in the world as, as Christine mentioned and as, as we discussed in our um, 
uh, uh, me previous meetings uh, with the group that's that um, seen these, uh, you know, these interconnected uh, colonial histories across regions um, over the 500 years of colonialism, that it has brought us to this point of, of, of climate catastrophe of, um, of a, uh, and s some of that work I, I do as an, as an artist is, it's not, you know, doesn't, I don't know what the practical application is, except it gives us ways to access um, these histories while accepting complexity and, and, and uh, working with affect, with feeling, um, in a space where um, um, a viewer can can um, be introspective, can inquire, can investigate, uh, and I, I typically work with form. Um, unlike the the work at, uh, in Landakin, which is really rare, I, I normally don't work with text or photos or data. I I, I work with um, uh, material I sculpt with my hands and. It gives kind of viewers, perhaps of all ages, a way to access the work and to be in that space where they have to wonder and question. And it's not that they need to know particularly the content I bring forward, but that it might invite them to investigate the history they're connected to and kind of have that inspiration, that, that agency to, to excavate in the, in the past. And I was talking with someone with, um, I had my, my hands were very dirty from working with clay. And I was like, well, it's like, I'm actually excavating all the time, almost physically with material, um, but also kind of through research and, and, and study. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think that is, um, I guess I, the, the other more specific thing I can say about my work before I, 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 I turn it over to Kevin is, um, is that some of my work has, I, I didn't really realize until in discussion with this group that my work has been about food as a kind of familiar thing that a viewer, it's kind of like a, a key or an entrance for the viewer to see something familiar, but suddenly the context and the meaning is different. So that opens up that space of, of wondering that I mentioned. And I have worked with uh, one example that Tatiana and I now share is breadfruit, which is a, called ulu in the Hawaiian language, but it is a it was a fruit that traveled in canoes with the first human migrations across the Pacific and also has colonial histories. And it enabled me to connect the Pacific with the Caribbean, which you know, is a way, something that was denied to me in my education, like Christine said, a colonial education, uh, that to see myself and histories, regions interconnected beyond the kind of, um, you know, the, a, a content and relation defined by the metropole. And um, to kind of see empire broadly, and I and future work will look at kind of sugar, and I, that's a path. It's a kind of topic many many people have looked at, but it's a way to kind of keep thinking about green gold, this kind of way that um, profit, trade, cultivation, and botanical research ha has a colonial context that needs to be examined. Is obviously family ties. Um, um, with my family history. But anyway, thank you. It's really nice to be here and to learn with everyone. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Um, and last but definitely not least, Kevin. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Quiles Bonilla. Um, first, again, to Gabrielle and Tatiana for creating this uh, amazing space with this um, small community that we're creating. Um, for those who are uh, visually impaired, um, I am uh, uh, I am in my mid twenties. Um, I have curly black hair, uh, black eyeglasses. I have a great T-shirt that says "Ramp It Up," and behind me is a window and a beige wall. And I am also coming to you from the Lenape land, also known as Manhattan. Um, so I am uh, essentially I, I'm basically a, a visual artist and. I focus um, mainly on the mediums of photography, video, and performance. And through uh, that practice, I ex interested in exploring the, the colonial relationship between uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. And sort of how and sort of how how does colonialism inform um, the different intersections that I inhabit? So not only my identity as a Puerto Rican, but also my identity as a queer person, as a person of color, as a person with disability. Um, and 
I think I, I share um, a lot of what uh, Rachelle was saying, you know, about how um, through my practice, I am very interested in this idea of unearthing, of unearthing legacies, of unearthing histories. Um, so yeah, I think initially I was also, um, I, I, I was thinking a lot about what could I bring into to this round table. And, and it was really interesting in, in our conversations from, from, from beforehand that uh, it was really beautiful just to see all the threats that were being created. So yeah, I'm very excited to be a part of this round table with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is sort of um, put a broad sort of topic out there and and see how the discussion, you know, uh, evolves around that. Um, and, you know, all of the participants in the discussion can feel free to kind of you know, um, respond to it and 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 see where it takes you. Um, or if you want to bring up, you know, a different topic, feel free to do that as well. Um, but I just wanted to start with this question about um, sustainability and what does that term really mean? Um, and specifically, I guess, in relation to food production and food justice. Um, and how has that term sort of evolved? And one of the things that, um, you know, I know it's a very, very basic question, especially for um, the people on this panel, but um, I, you know, it, I think we have certain assumptions about what it means. And, um, and so I wanted to just kind of like pick that apart a little bit and, and kind of talk about, you know, it has the meaning of, changed and and our ideas about what sustainability is and also the question of sustainability for for whom right like is it for um i mean or for whom or for what like is it for the sustainability for the land is it sustainability for the people for the industry the crop industries that are using the land as a resource um, and and who who and what is it sustaining i guess um so i don't know who wants to take that one uh, i have a couple of thoughts i would love to share and i'm sure um, other people will have a lot of different entry points um but one thing that comes to mind, you know, in, in the context of our larger conversation on um, colonial legacies and how they impact our relationships to land. Um, sustainability, it, you know, it's, it's a beautiful word if, if you sort of take away all of the business jargony branding stuff that has kind of attached itself to that word um, in recent years. Um, and I almost like before it was a quality or, you know, a brand pool um, or a business concept uh, or any of those things. Um, I feel that maybe it was really just more of a description of a way of being and um, way of being in which people are actually not at all separate from the landscape that they belong to, you know? And um, as um, I think it was, uh, I'm gonna maybe misquote, I think it was Robin Wall Kimura who said, we belong to the land. It may have been another indigenous writer Sorry if I'm wrong about that. Um, but, you know, in that kind of conception, um, we're really uh, inseparable from the landscape. And so just by virtue of existing over many generations in a landscape um, pre-industrialization, we were sustained, 
we were sustained by the land, sustained by the food, we sustained systems that sustained us. Um, and it was just a kind of circular feeling, right? Um, and maybe that word, if we apply it to, um, you know, in that way where people are really rooted and connected in places even today where people are still very rooted and connected to the, the land and practicing their traditional ecological management of the land. Um, it's not really a term that creates a layer of separation. But I think the way that it's used now, <clears throat> it is a business term, it is a branding tool um, it is often described as, you know, a triple bottom line, which is it's good for the environment, it's good for the people, and it's um, good for the economy, right? Um, and I think what's unfortunately happened is that the concept has now also been um, commodified. And because of how we use it, it, it has sort of begun to reinforce that separation between, you know, me and the land that I once belonged to. I mean, I don't even really know what land I belong to now, but at some point, at somewhere, you know, some of my ancestors, actually at my grandparents' level, you know, they belong to the land where they, where they live. Um, so my thoughts, I, I don't think it's bad, you know, to, if, if that's an end point for businesses who want to do better or worried about um, their overall impact, it's a starting place, you know, and it's, it's the beginning of a, hopefully a long journey. And, and we hope that they, that everybody who takes the journey, that they don't stop with like the, that an invitation to start doing things that are less harmful then things that maybe are restorative and then really just keeps going with the exploration through our through um, connecting to the land to reach this other place that's really more about an inner transformation. Yeah, I feel like um, that word has really become a buzzword. I agree with you, Jungwon, that you know, it really is tied to um, capitalism. And, and the problem that I have with this term is that it pretends that we're not in a climate crisis, that we actually do have a bottom line of what is considered sustainability. Um, so sustenance, um, to sustain oneself in a mode of crisis uh, in the planet is just, it's an oxymoron. It's not I don't, I don't think that it has any, it's been emptied, the term has been emptied of meaning because it doesn't reply, it doesn't apply to our reality. So how do we live in our reality really with transparency? And so one of the um, ethical modes within the Asequia communities in New Mexico that are also colonial. I mean, we can unpack this later. We are talking about the, the layering of colonialism over indigeneity, over colonialism, over indigeneity, over corporatization. Um, but anyways, going back to these small Asequia communities that, that identify and call themselves water democracies is the act of sharing scarcity. So it acknowledges in that term that we live in a mode of scarcity. And so all of the all of the system is predicated on scarcity of the many uh, in to give the resources to the very few. So when we use this word sustainability, it's almost like we are acquiescing to the idea uh, uh, that we could be living in a sustainable world. That this is enough, um, and I I just refuse to think that. I like this idea of sharing scarcity because it, the scarcity is not just about water resources. Uh, the scarcity is about um, having access to water, having access to money, having access to community, um, having access to education, laboring in the land. I mean, it's kind of an ecosystem of the way that scarcity kind of uh, weaves its way into the ability to survive. 
Um, and that when you're sharing that scarcity, you're agreeing, it's like a contract within the community that you're agreeing that if we do not have enough, in this case, within the agricultural communities, if we don't have enough water uh, and we see the way that it's affecting our lives, um, that we all are going to share this struggle together. Um, it's not, and that is directly opposing the, um, the state policy that um, is predicated on senior and junior water rights. And also this law that is, if you don't use it, then you lose it, which is, um, you know, a catch 22 to say the least, because you're living in a desert region. And so water policy is based on using the water instead of uh, you know, saving it or thinking of more riparian ways of uh, harvesting it. Um, so the whole system, I mean, I think we really need to acknowledge the system uh, is just not sustainable. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave it there. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to jump into the conversation. For, first time, I wanted to thank uh, Christine and, and Jung Won for bringing in the topics of um, of industrialization and 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 colonialism because it made me it made me think a lot about the current situation of Puerto Rico. So um, uh, before Puerto Rico was passed on to to the United States um, during the, the Spanish-American War. Uh, even though Puerto Rico belonged to Spain, it had a very vibrant um, agriculture uh, economy. Um, and once it was passed on to the United States um, and industrialization sort of began on, on the island and you know the cities began to expand and they began to construct suburbs and you know along with the suburbs came you know the malls and came you know, the restaurants, uh, uh, slowly the land was being destroyed and, and was slowly being, um, uh, yeah, essentially destroyed. And so one of the questions that uh, has been touched upon a lot in, in, in Puerto Rico at the moment is if there ever was um, a moment in which the island would become independent from the United States, what would be the economies that could sort of allow the island to then become self-sufficient? Um, and unfortunately, agriculture w w could not be one of those uh, economies anymore because the land has been essentially d destroyed and, and minimized. So yeah, that was just a thought that I had. <laughs> I'd love to jump into this conversation too. Um, and yeah, I'm a grateful to in hearing just like the, refra the reframing of what it means because I do think the way that we have evolved the word sustainability is kind of to us has taken on this definition almost of like how can I keep taking whether it's for myself or whether it's for a business um, and I I and I think there are some aspects of sustainability which like have a lot of like the essence that like Jung Won was talking about too and I like to think of it also um, or like instead of like sustainability, I'd love to be striving for like reciprocity and relationships of respect. Um, and I think about um, in in there's like different cultures, like um, in um, some Jewish communities as well. As I remember, I learned this when I was in the outskirts of like Cusco in some time where um, every seven years they just let the land rest. Um, and I think about what does it mean to have this type of relationship where we we acknowledge or just like allowing um, some something or a being or this entity that we see with life and with value to just rest. And I think about that too in, in the term of when we think about farming of like, how do we also act in reciprocity and respect with the, the people who are laboring, who um, are often just incredibly undervalued um, to very intensive labor um, and things that like in my mind, I'm just like, in no way is this sustainable or um, to their bodies, to themselves, to, to their families. Um, and so for me, when I think about um, the world in which I, I would love to like live in or the practices that I would like to see us holding is um, 
how can we actually grow or farm in, in a way that's actually a lot more slower in a way that respects our bodies in a way that respects um, the plants as well. So a, a lot of um, larger scale farming is, you know, just sometimes just cutting down like the whole plant versus like you can work with plants to get multiple harvests out of it with care or even like what does it mean to like also like leave to the land or leave to give back to other animals. Um, I think there's so many ways it, when we realize um, that it's not just taking for ourselves, but to, to give back um, is, is relationships that allow um, us to be more, a lot more connected and a lot more whole and also um, moving with a lot more respect for the life around us as well. I, yeah, I, I think that it's very interesting um, to hear, for me to hear, like, I had to search what scarcity mean, because at some point I thought that maybe I was like not understanding the word, right? So, but, but I think that, I think that when it comes down to food and to think, like hearing you, Ceci, talk and explain, like, it, I immediately thought about, you know, being at my dad's house and then just going and picking up a few leaves and the lettuce continues to grow. And like how, like that relationship, I think that one of the things that I've always been hit really hard since I moved to the States is how much food gets wasted. And I think that that thought that there's just innumerable sources, like that is that there's not an end or that idea of like, even if you're, buying food from the cheapest place, like the portions are so gigantic and it just, everything seems to be exaggerated. And I think that that link of like, just eating in excess is very shocking to me because it connects a lot to that relationship to like, it, it, I, I can see how we're, how there's not a connection of like where that food is coming from and the impact that it's having in the land, in the people that work, in the animals or in the same plants. And I think that that idea of like really thinking or starting to think from a place of like not having, like having just enough that you're not overusing or you're throwing to like be, be just be able to like use the resources that you have in a conscious way because there's scarcity <laughs> it it can really transform it can really transform that but i feel that the information that is constantly being fed is very different and 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 for and 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 it's like the messages around food are so so different that i i feel that somehow i think that this is a question kind of for both of you, Ceci and Yunwan is also, it's such a complicated topic because I also see that the places that offer food that where they're thinking better how to take care of the land seem to be also places where the food is very expensive. So it's also, it, it also create this kind of disparity between like different economic backgrounds and 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 it seems just like that that connection and like it feels like a very difficult subject because it feels very connected to privilege especially for that's how i see it a lot here in in the united states and it's i haven't been you know i've lived in the united states for 21 years so i don't know if that has changed over the years also in countries like Colombia and in other countries where maybe somehow what I would kind of consider new ways of colonization like McDonald's, Starbucks that you know started arriving later on and came with a different concept around food, if that has affected the way that even people relate to their own food sources um, and the relation that they have to their own food systems. Uh, but like, one of the things that I'm thinking is, uh, Ceci, you're working here and like you're working in Brooklyn, you're working like locally and young one, you're working internationally. And it's how, 
how does that idea and how how are your approaches or your thinking or how are the conversations that happen around that this differences in between like of difference of e e economic well like of the different uh, economic uh sis like uh <laughs> Yeah, so it's like a strata, right? Or the yeah, or the um. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, it's such a hard, it's such a hard um, and challenging thing to untangle because we, um, you know, our our food chains, um, especially when we live in urban areas, our food chains are so long very long food chains and people in New York, they want to have their year round avocados and their pineapples and, and um, their strawberries from, from California. Um, and, you know, the, there's a reason that commodity crops are grown. They're just really high in demand. Like who, you know, who can live without coffee, right? That's what people always say. How can you live without coffee? I must have coffee, you know? And it's not something that grows well in this climate. So it does have to come from far away. And the result of that extractive um, food system is that the people who grow the food, they, um, and this is especially true in the case of cacao, they, often will use as much of their land as possible to grow the cash crop and then not grow nutritious food crops for them, for their own families. So um, when COVID, uh, when the COVID pandemic first really began to travel all around the world, it was just so terrible. We, you know, a lot of our uh, sort of community, our partner communities, um, uh, farming communities, especially in our farmer training programs, we um, always encourage farmers to diversify their crops, grow food crops by all means and diversify because someone in London is determining the price of cacao, you know, and that price is going to rise and fall every day and smallholder farmers don't have any insulation from that. They're so vulnerable to these decisions that are made by traders who are trading futures, you know, and derivatives like so far away. Um, and, but it's hard because when the, the market price goes up, then farmers, especially those who are desperately poor, they see this opportunity like, oh, you know, in the last couple of years, like, oh, the price of cacao has really gone up or the price of whatever has gone up. So I'm going to use all of my land. I'm going to sort of take a risk and use as much land as possible to grow so that I can make enough money to, you know, send some kids to school, one or two kids to school, whatever, whatever decision making process it is. And what's really, um, what was really hard with COVID is that, um, a lot of those uh, supply chains broke that they it was they were disrupted because there were like travel restrictions in different countries. So my colleague in Peru um, was telling me that the a lot of coffee farmers, like smallholder coffee farmers, were just traveling around with bags of coffee cherries and hoping to trade the cherries for food because. They hadn't really been growing food so that they could, you know, earn more growing coffee, and um, it was just was such a vulnerable position. And all of this is just not only is it not sustainable, it's just untenable. It's not survivable. Um, so I, you know, I don't really, I don't have any, you know, answer other than to offer that. I think the kind of like, if we're gonna talk about a, a sustainability transformation, it has to be so much deeper than what anyone is really talking about um, in the business world or the, the brand, you know, the brand, I, I, all of the conversation around sustainability, it's, it's sort of, um, it's very surface level. And the kind of transformation we need, I think it's really even hard for people to imagine because it, it, it wouldn't look anything like 
Like it would mean not having avocados, period. As a New Yorker, no avocados for us. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a different paradigm. I guess we, maybe we could if we had like a, a greenhouse situation. We, we have to use, you know, maybe use some technology and see if we can figure it out. But, you know, it's very deep. And that's why I really appreciate, um, I appreciate the work um, that Ceci and BK Rod are doing. Um, you know, it's, it's not a, a, a food system, but it is very much a regenerative system that's locally based. And I just, I hope one day or I dream that supply chains become really, really short and really, really local. And that we just, you know, we, we begin to understand that for our climate future, we just can't have everything all the time from anywhere in the world. We shouldn't want that anymore. Yeah, I mean, I feel like when I hear this question, I'm just like, well, it's just that honestly, like capitalism is just very broken. And this is why we're living in this world. Um, I mean, and obviously like the histories and decisions that got us here and the power. Um, yeah, I guess I've, I've also, um, I also do some like cultivation or growing or I'm um, in, uh, I'm also working to start like a medicinal herb cooperative farm and in some exercises that I've done through like farm business planning, even just seeing how people plan out budgets, um, just to see like, for example, what would the cost of like a dozen eggs be. Um, and I'm yeah, as like kind of like a joke when we were going in and doing like the budget, we're like, what if we gave chickens a retirement line, like versus like, you know, most people only have their chickens for like a year or two when they're like producing the most eggs and then that's it. Um, and um, the cost of eggs would just go so high if um, we were valuing everything um, to to produce like um, eggs that were, were grown or cultivated in um, this more, uh, way that honors multiple beings involved. And so um, I think it then it then does make it this way that it becomes really inaccessible um, because that's how our markets are set up because actually food is incredibly undervalued. And when you see something so inexpensive, like I can't even imagine like how, how much the farm workers were paid to to create that. Um, and so, but on the, the other side, when I think about um, the power um, of what I've seen, like of, of opening access through work like BK Rot and through community gardens or through people who practice their own um, cultivation or home growing, um, I think it starts to break down those barriers a lot because it allows someone to be directly um, relating. Um, like I know, for example, at um, the garden where Bree um, does composting um, a lot there, you know, they grow, they grow fresh food there. Um, some that's like nourished by like the compost or like their next season will be nourished by compost that Bree, you know, picked up from different people's houses and brought there and processed and created. And um, when I've gone there from time to time, I see um, Kim, someone who, who is often there from the garden supporting them on Sundays giving them collard greens or, or different um, fruits and veggies that are happening. And so it kind of um, creates more of this, this access point or seeing, um, I think a, a big thing about why BK Rot started was also to support having local youth, having more access to outdoor spaces, to green spaces. Um, and yeah, when I think about our, our primary garden, the garden membership is, um, has been predominantly white. That's, that's starting to change now. Um, but when you go into that garden space, a lot of time you just see a lot of young um, black and brown um, people, black and brown youth um, who are doing, who are leading that work. Um, and also um, through being in that space, then start having access to um, like, you know, we're when the garden's in production, we're like, if you ever want like anything that's growing here, you can have access to it and also starts um, some of them are have become more interested in learning how to plant or how to grow or garden. Um, and so for me, it's like, but that's also like, I don't know, I think there's also something about community gardens in New York City that can sometimes be very inaccessible to people. Um, 
or sometimes some are, are kind of gated or especially right now we're seeing during COVID. Um, you know, even our garden is closed to the public, um, but we have been accepting some new members. Uh, so it, I guess for something that I'm really thinking about is like how, um, how do we work to create um, more public spaces that um, support um, anyone who wants to get involved in, in cultivation or just like, I would love to see like New York City transformed into so many different food forests where, you know, people can just go and access whatever it is that they want at any time or having like a low maintenance system. Um, but I do think it's a lot about um, how do we shift access to land and giving more like community community access to like land and cultivation, I think is like ultimately um, where um, we need to be like heading to, to be able to have access to fresh food. Front yard gardens, maybe some um, incentives for um, incentives for homeowners to plant front yard gardens. So there's not enough space for a food forest. Yeah, and once you see your neighbor doing it, you wanna do it too. I feel like that's the biggest thing when you see that it's possible. Um, I, I think I want to bring up maybe one more topic and before we open it up to um, questions from the audience. Um, we are sort of running out of time, but I wonder if um, we could talk about um, I guess one of the things that um, that we in our one of our meeting in our uh, preliminary meeting uh, conversation that we talked about was this idea of food as a way of um, connecting um, people across different you know diverse um, communities um, and sort of food being and cuisine you know sort of being this catalyst for um, creating connections um, but I feel like in our discussion, we also what also got revealed was that a lot of these, um, a lot of the food that we know as as um, representative of a particular culture or tradition um, is actually the product of colonization and you know different cultures, um, you know settler uh, colonist cultures coming in and either um taking you know f food or exotic um produce or fruits from you know one part of the world and then bringing it back to europe or um somewhere else and then that gets incorporated and and um and sort of reappropriated uh into um the cuisine of of, of the colonist uh culture um, so if you think about um, potatoes, you know, coming from the new world and I mean, people think about, I don't know, um, like British food being like very meat and potatoes, but the British didn't have potatoes before they, they went to um, North America. So thinking about that kind of thing, I wonder if um, anyone would like to talk about that. Um, I might call on Rochelle actually because um, he didn't talk uh, uh, that much in the last discussion. But and I know that your your um, your work in particular uh, looks at that those aspects. I was worried you might call on me, Gabriel, sitting here quietly. Um, but um, uh, actually. Just to follow up, I really love this learning from this discussion, um, uh, Jungwon, Ceci, Tatiana, Christine, and, 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 and everything you said, I, I'm just um, um, very grateful to be here. And I, I, I want to just mention, I, um, you know, these questions of entitlement and, you know, and, and excessive um, consumption and um, the strat, how, how that, how, what are the different ways that we can deal with that? You know, education, um, introspection, kind of, you know, these um, 
you know, challenging private property by making a front yard accessible to anyone with the food that's grown there, for example. But I'm, just, I'm I feel really charged by this discussion. Um, um, oh, you know, one thing actually, I would just follow up and say about the potatoes. It's very interesting. Um, you know, um, the fertilizer required to grow potatoes in Europe required Chinese mining of uh, Chinese laborers in the 19th century uh, to do guano mining in Peru. And, uh, and you know, these are kind of, an, it's just one early example. So it's part of my history. I mean, my, my father's side is mixed actually, but my, you know, this, this idea of, 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 of the exploitation of, of, of labor and the circulation and, and, and examining all these parts. And so um, in the 19th century, the, the, the guano pits are kind of, um, you know, what is a polite term to explain guano? The seabird droppings by the tons, by, I don't know, massive, massive mines um, um, that required, it was horrific work and it brought a lot of the, um, I don't know, bacteria or virus that uh, contributed to the potato blight. And, and so these are kind of early ways that, that, and that there's a uh, really problematic circulation of things and um, uh, very horrific, but, um, um, I, 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 I did, um, I'm not quite sure how to uh, follow up on this, except perhaps Gabriel, I could throw it back on you because you talked about adobo in, in our pregame discussion and I was very intrigued by that. And I was wondering if maybe you, um, if, if I could pass that back to you and, and if you want to share that, I don't know. Sure, that's fine. Um, <laughs> No problem. Uh, yeah, so um, I was trying not to make <laughs> to make uh, this discussion be um, as much about me but, and more about our illustrious speakers. But um, so yeah, my my background is um, is Filipino mainly. So I'm both of my parents were born and raised in the Philippines, um, but I'm of mixed uh, mixed race Filipino Hispanic and white American um, background. And um, so one of the things that um, I didn't really learn until I was an adult was that um, the Philippines was a colony of the US um, for 50 years um, from 1898 until 19, the late 40s, I think. Um, and uh, it was a colony of Spain before that. So the Philippines is also a twice colonized um, place. And, um, and, you know, sort of like Puerto Rico, um, it was a colony of, of Spain first uh, for 300 years, actually. And then, um, and then it be, and then in the Spanish American War, because Spain lost that war, they gave the Philippines, gave in quotation marks, the Philippines to the US, even though the Philippines had already declared independence from Spain, but Spain didn't honor it. So, um, so they, you know, um, it wasn't their right to give um, the Philippines to, to the US and, but they did it anyway. And it became uh, a US colony. And so, um, anyway, <laughs> going back to food and adobo. Um, so, one of the the dish that's, if there's a dish that's considered like the national dish of the Philippines, it's um, adobo, uh, and it's um, it's basically it's a dish made with meat, usually chicken or pork. Um, and it's made with um, vinegar and soy sauce. Um, and there's so many different va variations, like every household in the Philippines makes it their own way. Um, and some people put coconut milk in it, some don't. So um, uh, it, it's, it's a dish that is uh, pre-colonial, um, you know, um, it was a dish that was being made before Spain uh, colonized um, the Philippines. And because it's called adobo, I think a lot of people assume that it was um, that it was brought over from Spain. Um, 
but it actually uh, is an, you know, an ancient dish, I guess. And um, and when the Spaniards came and settled, um, colonized the Philippines, um, they gave it the name adobo because it reminded them of the flavors of these um, sort of sour, tart, and salty flavors. Um, and it was always made with um, with vinegar and some kind of salty element. Um, and then at one point, uh, because of um, sort of exchange with uh, China, um, it was they started to make it with soy sauce. Uh, so soy sauce actually is coming from uh, Chinese influence. So the dish itself it has a lot of um, different influences, even though it's considered, you know, a, a Filipino quintessential Filipino dish. Um, so yeah, that's the story <laughs> about uh, about food and how it can sort of represent. Uh, these sort of dishes that are known for a particular culture really kind of represent um, influences of many different cultures that are brought over um, because of colonization and other and other and trade and other types of contact. Um, I want to open it up to questions from the audience because I realize we're running out of time. Um, who has a question about any of the topics that we've discussed or for any of the guests, um, any of the speakers that we have here. If you have a question, um, please write it in the chat and, um, and then we can, we'll read it. Okay, uh, here we go, sorry. I did want to just say, um, Tatiana, do you want everyone to be in one like Zoom room now for the Q&A or do you want to keep it in the spotlight view? What do you think? I I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, this way. Then. I don't know. Whatever whatever works better. And I yeah I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Don't have an answer. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, do we? We want to start with um, somebody asked a question a little while ago. Um, Jennifer Moulton, um, I'm in the movement teaching profession. I'm so struck by what you're all saying and how it relates to the way I think about the care of the body, land, and body inextri are inextricable. Um, I guess that's not really a question, but that's um, a really nice um, comment. Um, okay, so Leslie Kirby asks, uh, could the concept of community and front yard gardens become stakeholders in large rooftop gardens like Brooklyn Range? Who wants to take that one? I'm a little bit confused by the question. If I'm Me honest. too like the become stakeholders i'm not so clear on what becoming a stakeholder would mean um is leslie on the call still no okay um okay well, maybe we'll move on to the next question um or I also look, I saw that Jim Wan was also unmuted, so I don't know if you had a thought there. Um, I, I'm not really sure I understand what the question was, but I do know that, um, I mean, there are some wonderful examples of people who have uh, cultivated food forests in, I think in the UK and um, New Zealand, and these are all, um, things that we can maybe learn from um, and try to adapt to local contexts. Um, in Los Angeles, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle some years ago when um, a food activist whose name escapes me at the moment, but I think there was a big effort to grow 
food on those um, health, they're called hell strips. I don't know why they're called hell strips, but those patches of dirt on the sidewalks. So those are called hell strips in case you didn't know. Um, yeah, so uh, a, a food justice activist, um, you know, really started uh, getting a lot of people to plant food there. And then it kind of became this fraught, like local political debate because some people didn't want food growing there. They felt that it would attract, you know, God forbid, people who needed food, um, which is exactly what they were for. Um, and it just definitely became a thing. Um, I think there's some, there's always going to be some resistance to kind of these like beautiful people driven, um, you know, I guess innovations or responses to um, food scarcity. But I don't think that that should stop anybody from trying. You know, we, um, my neighbor and I grow food in our front yard and um, I, I planted a peach tree there a while ago. And sometimes people come and they take peaches and uh, people, kids will walk by and say, hey, can I have a tomato? And, you know, yeah, sure. That's, I mean, it's here, you know, and there's no gate so they can literally just come and, and pick stuff. Um, it would be so beautiful if, if, um, if that became a thing. And one way to at least alleviate a little bit our dependence on these really long and complex food chains. Yeah, I, I really like that idea of, um, you know, I mean, it maybe goes back to this idea of um, sharing, you know, sharing scarcity that Christine was talking about. And, or maybe even if it's not, I mean, it, not even scarcity, but it could be sharing abundance too. Um, you know, and, and thinking about like, if you have a garden in the front yard, um, you know, why isn't it, why wouldn't it be okay for people in the community to come in and take a fruit or a, you know, or tomato every once in a while? Who else has a question in the audience? No one? Do it, does anyone, um, do any of the panelists, um, do you have questions for each other or any burning um, comments you want to make? One question that I would bring up to the group is we are having this conversation in the context of an art exhibition, <laughs> um, which right now I feel like is not acknowledged. And so we have three artists on the panel here who are driven by, uh, you know, an aesthetic um, inclination to asking questions and driven to um, having a practice that maybe doesn't pretend to have an answer. And I think it's really interesting that we've met, we've, we're also an interdisciplinary panel as well, um, because we're reaching out to um, people who are also working in very result driven um, capacities um, and community efforts. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm so curious about um, the way that, or maybe some of the tensions that arise or and some of the bridging that arises from a panel like this, where we have these interdisciplinary um, potentials. Um, and I don't know if that's clear enough as a question, kind of just off the cuff of my head, but I teach um, interdisciplinary practice at the university at Emily Carr University where I teach. And so I'm always, I have no answers for what that is, but I recognize that artists have, especially in the world of like the so-called eco arts, um, that there are different agendas. There are um, different ways that this, that these politics kind of manifest themselves um, in social practice. 
Um, and so I'm just curious to hear from maybe the group of artists um, what you think about having this conversation um, that works across disciplines like this, or if you feel like you do that in your own practice already. Um, I can answer a little bit of that. Um, I think that I didn't start this when I didn't introduce this when I started the conversation, but I found out about two years ago that I'm dyslexic. I'm 46 years old. <laughs> I lived all my life without having any acknowledgement of knowing this. And this is one of the reasons also why I started doing this kind of um, interactions. And it's because I found myself when I started doing my work to people coming and asking me questions and I don't have the answers. I'm just kind of questioning everything that is around me and questioning things through my work and questioning how I relate to the land and trying to just, it's constantly just questioning everything that I'm doing and how, and in every sense. And when I started being asked about the solutions and, and I was, my first thing was like, I need to start reading more about the environmental, like trying to educate myself more and more. And it just kind of became very stressful because I was first starting out of a kind of a reaction of something that I had lived. I was just uh, creating the work that I was creating out of like, like just kind of digging deep what I was feeling of like coming here and and a whole other history and history in my family and my country. And I didn't have those questions. And when I was trying to go reading, I would just read three paragraphs, lose my process of thinking. I just couldn't follow through. And that's when, when I found out and I started realizing that I needed to learn by having conversations with many people of like subjects that I wanted. So it does has become something that it's part of my practice it's having conversations constantly with people that are not from my discipline and just having a constant interaction and finding people uh, that have a different perspective over a different uh, approach to things that I'm interested in and, and learning from them. So I think that that's how one of the ways in which I met Dion Juan and for me, every time that I have a conversation with her, I, I find that I leave with so much, like with a whole perspective and, and learn. And that even happens every time that I talk to you, Christine, when I've talked to Rochelle and Kevin, to Ceci, every time that I talk to somebody and I get to, I, I learn a lot from having, uh, from having these conversations of having or, or meeting people and learning about them. So the more that I do this, the more that it becomes sort of important for my practice to embrace things like, like this um, and just kind of set myself out of like finding different methods of educating myself uh, alternative to um, and I don't mean, and I don't want to sound like I don't even try reading. I have piles of books and I, I'm constantly just going through the process, but I need to find different alternatives to my learning process and to be able to grow and find more information uh, from the things that I'm interested to this discuss and question. Did, did, that, did, I, did that answer the question? I don't know if I went into like a set way or something. I, I would also like to just add to, to the question, to the answer, do you know, that I, I'm also, I'm, I'm really interested in this idea, you know, of just creating the spaces where we can exchange ideas without, as you, as you said, Christy, not necessarily having a resolution, because um, these are overarching, you know, issues that are, that are going on globally, but, uh, you know, just a space where we can all come from like a very, like, like, like a common ground, you know, I feel that sometimes, um, in order for me to frame my, my work, uh, I need to almost become like an ambassador to Puerto Rico. And I sort of need to like start from like ground zero and sort of like start explaining. So 
So Puerto Rico was discovered and da, 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 and then it was colonized. And, you know, so it's really nice to just um, have this, this space, you know, where, where even though we all come from different spaces within, you know, the Pacific or the Black Atlantic, you know, we, we still can find these threats in which we can connect um, the, the experiences that, that we all share. Yeah, I guess, um, I guess as a curator, sometimes I question <laughs> my, you know, my role and my profession as um, uh, somebody who um, organizes art exhibitions, um, because, you know, it, it does beg the question, you know, what does an art exhibition actually do? Um, and, um, and so it is it is more about providing a platform for um, for dialogue and um, discussion and and a lot of times the setting the platform is really just a place to I don't know it um, to ask more questions and um, yeah and so there's there's not really any kind of result necessarily that comes out of it. Um, and so that's why, you know, I admire um, people like Ceci and Jungwon that are, you know, really um, like doing the work um, and that are um, going out into the communities and, um, and, you know, doing this sort of work on the ground and, and grassroots work. Um, and also there are social justice artists who are also, you know, going in um, to the communities and and doing that kind of work where, um, you, you know, there it's more than um, sort of provoking thought. It's really like, you know, actually working with the communities and, um, you know, whether that's food justice related or, um, you know, sort of battling, um, you know, anti-racism, like, so, uh, but in the context, you're right, like in the context of an art exhibition, we are sort of coming from a place of privilege, really. Um, and um, so it, it's good to kind of recognize that um, and to understand that, you know, we're in this privileged place where we can, have these conversations, but without, um, you know, without the real like consequences that uh, a lot of um, communities are dealing with. Does that make sense? Um, does anyone? I, I realize it's um, ten after eight. Um, does anyone have a last comment or? And I know that I saw some things pop up in the chat and I'm very sorry that we didn't get to address them. Um, does, does anyone have any last words? I'm so sorry. I just feel like I've been talking so much, but I put it in the chat, but I just really wanted to make a little uh, intervention and to say, you know, it's not like a one way flow of information or ideas. Um, I really just believe that art and artists are totally essential to what I would be more like pragmatically focused, programmatic, you know, um, interventions um, because they, um, art just helps us reminds us about um, complexity and about, you know, even unearthing as Rochelle talked about. Um, and it kind of keeps us, you know, focused on what is our motivation in addition to what are our goals um, and reminds us to be in integrity with the way that we carry out this kind of work. Um, so I know for myself too, um, I, I always um, seek to have interactions and conversations with um, artists and 
musicians um, and poets and, you know, people who just are not working in a, you know, nonprofit organizational context because that's what helps refresh, you know, keep the, the thinking um, fresh and not I don't know, didactic or, you know, too results driven. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jung Wan. That was that was a really nice um, way to sort of wrap things up. I mean, I, the, you're right. That art and artists have a great value in in society, and um, and I think um, you know I believe in the transformative power of art. So um, I want to thank all of the artists who are participating um, on this panel, but also in the exhibition here. Um, and did you want to say something, Tatiana? I was just going to say thank you so much to everyone to coming to to this and 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 just sharing all the different point of views, perspectives, and and knowledge. And um, I, I feel extremely uh, fortunate uh, to learn and from all of you and every conversation that we have. So, just that. Thank you. I just want to add in thank you for creating this space. <laughs> thank you, Tatiana. Um, and I want to thank our speakers, uh, Christine Howard Sandoval, Kevin Quiles Bonilla, Rochelle Deng, uh, Jung Wan Kim, and Ceci Pineda. Um, and I want to thank all of you in the audience for joining us. Um, thanks for sticking with us, um, even though we went a little bit over. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Kathleen Gilrain, Audrey Irving, and uh, Becky Selinger. Um, and um, I want to remind everyone that next Thursday, we are going to have a second round table discussion that will be centered on uh, fashion, the impact on the land and identi identity. Um, and the speakers next week will be uh, Angel Chang, who is a sustainable women's wear designer, Celine uh, Zeman of the Slow Factory Foundation, and then uh, artists Esteban Cabeza de Baca and Alison Maria Rodriguez will be part of that panel as well. Um, that's going to be at 6.30 on Zoom um, on Thursday, the uh, February 4th. And, and Tatiana also will be uh, hosting that as well. So uh, join us for that. You can look on our website, smackmelon.org, for more information. Um, thank you all very much, and have a good night. All right, thanks everyone. I'm gonna end the meeting. Thank you all so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Bye. Thank you, Ceci. Bye. Bye.